Hello, I'm Olivia from Geeky Medics. In today's video, we're going to talk through how to interpret the results from a spirometry test. A spirometry test involves the use of a spirometer, which is a small device that measures how much you can breathe out in a forced breath after maximal inspiration. This helps to assess the patient's lung function and distinguish between obstructive airway disease, such as in COPD and asthma, and restrictive lung disease, such as pulmonary fibrosis. In addition, for patients who have previously been diagnosed with lung disease, spirometry can be used to monitor the severity of the condition and response to treatment. Spirometry provides several useful measures. These include the forced expiratory volume in one second, abbreviated to FEV1. This measures the volume of air that is forcefully exhaled in one second after a patient has maximally inspired. This is similar to the peak expiratory flow rate you may have seen when using a peak flow meter. The forced vital capacity, abbreviated as FVC, is the total volume of air the patient can forcibly exhale in one breath. FEV1 over FVC is the ratio of FEV1 to FVC. The values of FEV1 and FVC are expressed as a percentage of the predicted normal for a person that is the same sex, age and height. In order to interpret the spirometry results, you need to know the correct reference ranges to compare these two. For FEV1, this should be greater than 80% of the predicted value. For FVC, this should also be greater than 80% of the predicted value. For the FEV1 over FVC ratio, this should be greater than 0.7. Before interpreting a spirometry reading, it's important to check the following. Firstly, check the patient's details, including their name, date of birth, and unique patient identifier. Secondly, check the quality of the results. Abnormalities in spirometry readings can be caused by coughing during expiration, extra breaths during expiration, a slow start to forced expiration, and sub-maximal effort. Now let's look at some graphs to compare obstructive versus restrictive disease. Let's look first at an obstructive spirometry pattern. If we compare the line representing the obstructive respiratory pattern compared to the normal pattern, we can see there is a significantly reduced FEV1 to less than 80% of the predicted value. This is because in obstructive airway disease, it's difficult to quickly expel the air. The FVC is also reduced, though to a lesser extent than the FEV1, and can even be normal. As a result of these, the overall FEV1 over FVC ratio is reduced, to less than 0.7. If an obstructive pattern is identified on spirometry, bronchodilator reversibility testing may be performed. The presence of bronchodilator reversibility can help confirm a diagnosis of asthma. In adults, an improvement in FEV1 of 12% or more, together with an increase in volume of at least 200 ml in response to a beta-2 agonist such as salbutamol, is regarded as a positive result, i.e. reversibility is present and asthma is a likely diagnosis. If bronchodilator reversibility is absent, this suggests a fixed obstructive respiratory disease, such as COPD. If partial bronchodilator reversibility is present, i.e. not enough to qualify as a positive result as previously described, this may suggest a dual diagnosis of both asthma and some degree of fixed obstructive respiratory disease, for example, COPD. There are many different causes of obstructive airway disease. This includes COPD, asthma, emphysema, cystic fibrosis, and bronchiectasis. Now let's look at the restrictive respiratory pattern. Here, lung compliance is reduced, resulting in stiff lungs. With restrictive lung disease, we can see the spirometry pattern looks different. Again, the FEV1 is reduced to less than 80% of the predicted normal. The FVC is also reduced to less than 80% of the predicted normal value. Overall, this results in a normal or even increased FEV1 to FVC ratio. There are also many causes of restrictive lung disease, which can be broken down to pulmonary causes or non-pulmonary causes. Pulmonary causes include pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary edema, pneumoconiosis, the patient having had a lobectomy or pneumonectomy, and parenchymal lung tumours. Non-pulmonary causes of restrictive lung disease include obesity or pregnancy, neuromuscular disease, connective tissue disease, and skeletal abnormalities, such as in kyphoscoliosis. 
Let's summarise the spirometry results. In obstructive airway disease, there is a significantly reduced FEV1 to less than 80% of the predicted value. The FVC is reduced, though to a lesser extent than the FEV1, and can even be normal. Overall, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 0.7. In restrictive lung disease, the FEV1 is also decreased to less than 80% of the predicted value. The FVC is significantly reduced to less than 80% of the predicted value. Overall, this results in an FEV1 to FVC ratio that can be normal or even raised to above 0.7. Finally, another lung test you should be aware of is the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide test. You may also see this test written as the transfer factor for carbon monoxide test. This test involves breathing in a small amount of carbon monoxide and measuring how much is able to diffuse from the lungs into the blood. There are different causes for an increased diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. These include exercise, asthma, polycythemia, pulmonary hemorrhage, and left to right cardiac shunts. Causes of a decreased diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide include emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, anemia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary emboli, and a decreased cardiac output. For further information on spirometry interpretation, check out the Geeky Medics website or have a go at interpreting a set of spirometry results using our OSCE bank.